And welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Peter Winnick. I'm the founder and CEO at Thought Leadership Leverage. And you're joining us on this LinkedIn Live, which is an extension of our podcast, Leveraging Thought Leadership. And today, and today only, is my guest. My guest is Jeremy Utley. Jeremy is the co-author of Idea Flow, which just came out last week. Uh, and he is a director of educational, executive education at Stanford's D School and an adjunct professor at Stanford's School of Engineering. And he is a friend. So welcome, Jeremy. So here we are. You are now a, a published author for what, six days now? Eight. It's been, eight it's, been a, it's been a long eight days, Peter. It's been a long eight days. Okay. So tell us uh, what those first eight days have been like, because it's been what a year of writing the book, you know, six months of planning yep. and then eight days of nonstop stuff. So what's, yeah. what's that been like? Uh, it, it's been incredible. I mean, to the book has been in my heart and the stories have been in my head for so long, mine and my co-author, Perry Claibon, that it's it's been really fun to get it out in the world and to have people interacting with the ideas. You know, we've we've been cherishing these memories and these stories and this research for so long that it kind of you become overly familiar to it in a way. And so to be hearing from friends from high school and college and grad school and, you know, former clients and you know, na people in the neighborhood and church and all sorts of right. people, you know, reaching out, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge compliment to, I have a construction worker friend, for example, who just the other day sent me a photo. He bought a new notebook and a pen. And he said, thank you for writing a spectacular book that I could understand. <laughs> and I thought it was, yeah. So all that, all that say people coming out of the woodwork to really say thank you, to appreciate, to resonate and to start applying some of the tools we teach has been really rewarding. So one of the things I always find interesting once a book is released is, you know, the, the authors are typically close, too close to it to be objective, number mm -hmm. one. And sometimes because the way publishing cycles work, you finished writing it almost a, years ago, a year ago. It's not as top of mind as it was, right? Because there's this calm before the storm. Right. Are there things that are resonating with folks that you didn't expect any, any surprises in terms of people saying, wow, this is the thing that I, that, that stood out the most for me. You know, I would say the thing that's been most surprising to me has actually been how my own thinking has continued to evolve. You know, I, what I've learned is a book is almost a snapshot of your knowledge at a point in time, but you keep learning, you know, and as right. you know, we, we recorded our audio book more recently and I'm reading through it. And, and in my mind, you know, we have a subject like experimentation, you know, as, right. as, a, as kind of a core mindset and tool set. I'm reading the chapter, you know, in the studio for the audio book. And I get to the end. I'm like, wait, we don't tell the, you know, blank, the Netflix story. And I was, <laughs> oh, I learned that, which is a perfect encapsulation after the manuscripts locked. Right. So my okay. mind's not locked in the same way that the manuscripts locked. So I continue to interact with the world, with inputs, with inspiration, with stories. And they become a part of my repertoire, so to speak. When I'm talking about a topic, I can't help but mention the Netflix experimentation story. And yet when I look in the book, I had this experience last night. I was at a big dinner with a bunch of VCs and entrepreneurs. And one of the VCs was talking to me about um, procrastination and how important he finds it. I said, oh, there's a whole section on there's this amazing research. Donald McKinnon, you know, World War II spy master who studied creativity. He found that delaying decisions is a hugely effective strategy. And I go to the index of the book. I'm like, let me show you where not it is. There. It's not there. Ah. It's this whole well, thing. You're, you're pre-selling volume two. That's what exactly. you're doing. There you go. Exactly. There you go. So a couple of thoughts on the book, because you and I have been working together for a little bit over a year on the book and, and a bunch of other things, is that you know the D school is there's no place better when it comes to innovation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yet when we look at the the business literature on innovation, part of there's been a couple of issues that I, I've seen, right, as as the outsider. One is Everybody loves innovation. There aren't too many anti-innovation people. Like, let's go right. back to the fax machine or I love the rotary phone. Haven't right. met those yet. M maybe the Amish a little bit. No, no offense to my Amish friends. Um, right. But, but there isn't an anti-innovation crowd. Yet, very few people actually own the function in their organization, mm -hmm. right? Where it's like on their business card, SVP, Director of Innovation. So it's really hard to find that place where it fits. And one of the things I love about the book is... The, you know, the, the subtitle, which we see it here, you know, the only business metric that matters because a lot of the literature on innovation in the past has been not bad, but it's abstract. It's cool. 
the creative part is really, really sexy. This is really somewhere between sort of Six Sigma meets like whiteboarding or something, right? So if you want to talk it's about pragmatic, the, yeah, definitely. What's that? It's meant to be pragmatic for sure. Yeah, which, really which is implemented. Yeah, so when most innovation books aren't that. So mm -hmm. do you, you want to give sort of a, a teaser or the highlight of what might that only business metric that matter be? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 doesn't excuse anyone from buying the book. Go buy the book now. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Peter. Yeah, the basic premise is um, when most people think about the task of coming up with solutions to problems, ideas are simply solutions to problems, um, they think in terms of good. And what the research would suggest is instead of thinking in terms of good solutions or good ideas, one should first think in terms of more. What I need is actually a volume of solutions, a volume of possibilities. The single greatest uh, determinant of the quality of an idea is actually the quantity of ideas. And so, so part of that problem, though, is, well, now I'm self-aware, right? Because every idea I put out, right. I want it to be good. If I have to, if, if the metric is volume, uh-oh, I'm going to be well, vulnerable. I'm going to put out stuff that's silly. I might not well, be my best Well, thinking. I would say if you want to focus, if there's an area to focus on volume, it's actually generating bad ideas. And people go, wait, what? Bad ideas? I go, yeah, be like Steve Jobs. Every day he'd sit down with, uh, with John, Sir Johnny Ive and he would say, um, you want to hear a dopey idea? <laughs> and Johnny said most of the time they were really dopey. In fact, a lot of times they were truly terrible. But every once in a while, they take the ah out of the room and leave us breathless in wonder, right? And the point is, when people try to come up with good ideas, that's the wrong goal. The goal should be to increase the volume and variation of your thinking and actually pushing yourself to come up with bad ideas is a great way to increase the variability of your thinking. Mm -hmm. Jobs knew that dopey is how you get to delightful. You know, when we think of Steve Jobs, we don't think he's dopey. We think of disruption and redefining categories. But every day he's sharing what he thinks are dopey ideas with a really smart collaborator. And so if you want to come up with more ideas, actually allow yourself to come up with bad ideas. And you, in, in so doing, you actually give yourself permission to increase the variability of your thinking and you increase likelihood of discovering really tremendous ideas as well. Got it. So the metric is the, is the volume. And, That's and you right. want to give secret, the secret sauce of, of what it is? Because you actually have a metric here. Well, it's very simple. Ideas over time. You can measure it in a minute. You can measure it in an hour. You can measure it in a month. I mean, a simple activity that we recommend in the book is find an email that you need to write that you haven't written yet. Ordinarily, you know, if I'm going to write Peter a note, I put Peter in the, you know, to field and then the subject line, I start writing the subject and then I move on. And I don't ever even think about alternative subject lines. We say, hey, for an email, you know, you need to write, set a timer for a minute and come up with as many subject lines as you possibly can. That is your well, that's interesting, right because we're all writing hundreds of emails a day. Yeah. A minute in the context of the a subject header for an email would pro I have to try it, but would probably feel like an hour, probably feel like a long time. Right. Why would I spend a minute? Right. But it's just a minute. But what you learn really quickly is what I mean, it, it exposes a lot of cognitive biases that keep us from creativity in a lot of other places, which is when you think of a solution, it's called the Einstein effect. When you think of a solution, your brain stops looking for other solutions. And yet there's no evidence that suggests that our early solutions are our best solutions. And in fact, there's evidence that suggests just the opposite, that identifying one solution prevents us from seeing better solutions. So, so by that's that, the goal to quantity rather than quality, you actually change the definition of success. And that's really the flow part of idea flow is letting yourself get into that place yeah. where you can just sort of not crank them out for the sake of cranking them out, but being in the zone. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. So thank, thank you for that highlight. So give us a sense now of, I, I, I think I want to spend a couple minutes here, if you would. So we've talked, I've talked to lots and lots of people over, people over the years about how hard it is to write a book. So we're not going to go there, but I want to talk about how hard it is to get ready to get a book to market. And then you're in the very early stages with a very full calendar of activity. So talk about sort of how, I don't know if difficult is the right word, but, but how much energy, effort, et cetera, and the teams involved in thinking about what needs to be done to get this book out there, tapping into your friends, tapping into your network, tapping into your communities, because this yeah. is the stuff that people don't really talk about enough in my humble opinion. 
no, there's a tremendous amount of coordination that happens in the, on the back end. And you think, well, the publisher markets a book and definitely they're, they're a tremendous and incredible resource. There's a marketing team, et cetera, publicist, you probably have PR folks, et cetera. Um, and with, even with all of their effort, there is an enormous amount of responsibility on an individual author to galvanize their friends and family and their followers and their clients and help people understand that the opportunity is out there. You know, and I think the tendency for, at least for me, is to feel very self-conscious of mentioning the book or because I go, oh, people already know. And the, and the truth is I already know, you know, but actually very few people do because the way social media algorithms work and otherwise even email open rates, it's highly unlikely that a message that you put out there is being consumed by anything more than a very, very, very small percentage of your audience or your. Sure, network. sure. So, but stay with this for a minute. So a lot of because I think you touched on a key point. A lot of folks are reluctant. It feels awkward. I'm not in sales of asking their friends and such to help yeah. them promote the book and spread the ideas and, and, and get it out into the universe. And I think what most are pleasantly surprised about is how receptive people are to helping you. They know you, they love you, they're a fan of the work, they appreciate you. And it's no big deal for someone to post something about the book or whatever. So how was how the perception of that? Or was that difficult at first? And have you gotten better at that? Yeah, I think um, I, I underest as, <clears throat> underestimated how many people would be enthusiastic to contribute, to be invited into the effort. And so that's been that's been a delight to realize is it's a joy for people who love you, for people who feel close to you or who feel close to the work. It's a joy for them to get to contribute and to get to be a part of it. And um, and there's no limitation on the number of people who can be involved. Right. So to have a launch team, for example, you can have a lot of people on the launch team, but people really enjoy being able to be a part of a launch team, for example. Yeah. And so a launch team for, for folks is, you know, you, 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 you recruit folks to help you launch and and it's not a compensation thing right. it's they're rooting for you and they're doing they're not doing a lot of heavy lifting but it's promoting on their social networks engaging people that they know about it you know yeah. pictures, etc and then what happens is you know it, it's like rooting for your favorite team when you're on a launch team even though you don't have a financial horse in the race you're like i want this book to win it's really right. cool right. when it's picked up on linkedin it's really cool when another thought leader comments on it or whatever and and now you've got this whole sort of cheering squad right. that's behind you and all you really have to do is ask and they're happy to do it well, and and the thing that i would say has been really surprising to me is to see how much other people's enthusiasm um refills my tank yeah you know, i didn't realize like it is a tiring endeavor you know you you work I, I actually was just talking to an author on on a web series that i run at stanford and he was saying, I love this quote. He said, the, the launch is like the sprint at the end of a marathon. He's like, you don't have the energy for it. It's exhausting. But if you don't sprint, then it's like you didn't run the marathon. Right. right. And, and he said it, it'd be a real tragedy to not sprint at the end. And I get it, which is to say, you know, you think about the like the end of a marathon, right? There's all those people with the little cups of Gatorade, right? Everybody in my life, they're just carrying this little cup of Gatorade, you know, and they give it to me and it's, it just, it's refreshing. And, you know, I get on the phone call, I, you know, doing all sorts of stuff and I get with my launch team, it's my people and my people are rooting for me and they're excited about what I'm doing. And they, they're coming up with, you know, harebrained ideas. And um, just when I feel like I go, you know what, let's just go to bed. They're like, we got to try this. And that's, um, that's, it's an incredibly special um, community that you have the opportunity to rally around you that you, you don't really realize it. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the other thing is that most books and certainly a book like this is an evergreen book. So yes, there's a sprint element to the launch to get that flywheel going. Right. But my instincts are with this book and I know it quite well is that we're going to see this book around for several, several years. It's not, you know, time sensitive. It's not right. like, Oh, it's going to go out of vogue and right. you know, Oh, more people are talking about work from home today than they will be in, you know, six months from now or something like that. Yeah. It, you know, and when you could connect thought leadership, and I think there's always sort of two variables here is what are the evergreen principles? Well, they're, they're chock full of them in the book. Right. And then what's going on in the real world that you can connect to. So now, for example, if we're, you know, we're going into a recession, well, what is, you know, what is recession mean? Well, it's, yeah. it's Latin for do more with less. It's not really Latin, right? Well, if you have to do more more with less, 
what better time to innovate, right? We get out of a recession, we go back to growth mode. Great, now we got all this capital to experiment. Great, right. innovate. So it's right. making sure that you can connect to what's going on in the real world and the business cycles and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, you know, when we had challenges last year with supply chain, there was some really interesting innovation going on of people now onshoring and having to manufacture in this country things right. like books. Publishers really quickly realized like, uh-oh, I can't get a book out there if it's sitting in a port in Long Beach for nine months months we forgot how to print in the states right yeah. uh oh we better figure out how to do that quickly right. so yeah cool any um what else would you share with us in terms of i mean it's early in the journey but uh, uh what else would you share if someone's out there thinking you know there's a book i should write well you know for me one of the things that's come up a lot people say why'd you write the book and i say there one part of the equation is it's an expertise I've been cultivating for the last dozen years, an obsession I've been cultivating for the last dozen years. So I am uniquely qualified to write the book. But the other reason I wrote it is, as they say, write the book you want to read. And yeah. for me, this like I had the experience while reading the audio book that multiple times I had to pause the recording because I wanted to take notes in my own book. Right. Which is to say what? <laughs> It's a book I wanted to read, right? And I mean, there's nobody's walking around with a book in their head, right? So I'm stumbling over stories and research that I had forgotten I knew at one point, right? So that was exciting. But to me, the if, if you're thinking about writing a book, then the question is, well, what kind of book do you, would you, do you really wish was in the world? And for me, this book is a book that I wish was in the world. You know, like the, I remember the old men's hair club, you know, that, you know, New Yorker, you know, I'm not, I'm not just the president. I'm also a member, you know? Yeah. And I feel like I'm not only the author, I'm also, I'm also the student, you know? And uh, there's a part of it that is guru-esque in that there's a, there's a unique and differentiated knowledge that I've been fortunate enough to acquire through collaboration with yeah. Harry and many others over the last dozen years. But then it's also, it speaks to a need that I have. And one thing that I've, you know, seen in my own life, I mean, I had this experience the other day, I'm driving around um, running some errands and the car is packed full and I had a, um, a cooler that was probably a 50 pound cooler that was like a, you know, sitting there like a Jenga brick of death right over my right <laughs> shoulder, you know, and every time I turn to the right, it slams into my arm and I'm just, ah, ah, you know, and I kind of, you know, jam my arm there while I'm driving to kind of, you know, give myself some relief. I'm, I'm honestly thinking I'm in the car for an hour. Is this going to damage my rotator cuff? I mean, it was really painful. Yeah. My brother called me. He's in construction and roofing in Texas. And he's, he called me. We're chatting on the phone for a couple minutes when he said a very brotherly thing. He said, why do you keep grunting? And I said, oh, I've got this stupid cooler. You know, it's just like it's killing right. me. Every time I turn, he goes, have you buckled it in? And I go, oh, my goodness. He goes, yeah, I mean, whenever I got a bunch of gear in the truck, I don't want to roll around. I just buckle it in. And I, in one minute my problem that I thought I was going to deal with for an hour was solved. Right. And I actually took a, been there before. Right. I took right. a photo of that because by the way, I've already written a book on creative problem solving. There's a whole chapter on seeking input from people from different disciplines. And exactly. right? I, if anybody knows to ask my construction working brother for help in a moment of need, it's me. And yet in that moment, I fall prey to the very same cognitive biases that everybody else does. And so, sure which is to say I need the material as much as anybody else. And I think if you're thinking about writing a book, writing the book you need and doing the work to assemble the, the research and the, and the expertise to be able to be a credible contributor to that, um, that sphere is, is really, really yeah. a powerful source of motivation and source of inspiration. So, so let me ask you this, because a lot of folks say, you know, this, this is work you've been deeply deeply in, involved in for a dozen years. So there is more that exists in your head and your life experience than made it to, you know, whatever, 200 and whatever pages. So one of the things that I hear from folks after the, you know, from the book writing process is, wow, it forced me to get concise. It forced me to codify my models and methodologies in a really tight way, because in order to write it, right, you can't like when you're, when you're teaching or you're, you know, in front of the whiteboard, you can kind of balance and get it out there. You got 20 different stories to draw on, whatever, but you've got a chapter on a topic and you've got, you know, 2000 words or whatever the allocation is. Yeah. You're on a budget, right? Yeah. You know, a budget of words, right? So did you find that uh, 
constraint of the printed page helpful or challenging or how did that work for you? I, you know, the, the challenge, a lot of the work is actually in sequencing, you know, how, sure. what is the proper kind of, you know, progression of ideas that leads someone to appreciate what we're trying to express. Um, mm -hmm. And I, one thing I noticed is the way I would approach a lecture, for example, and the kinds of things I'd emphasize in say a Ted talk, you can't, you can't, the, the transcript to a Ted talk is an HBR article, which is great, but it's not a book, you know, it's not, yeah. and you're not yeah. laying out your thinking like that. Right. And so while you should be able to take a book and put it into a Ted talk to take a Ted talk and try to extrapolate it to a book, um, it, it's, it's a totally different animal. And the way you approach the challenge of expressing the information is very different. And so, well, and a, and a lot of books have done that. The, the, expanded a TED talk, you know, 18 minutes or whatever to a book. And there's, there's a lot of breadcrumbs in the meatball. You're like, okay, yeah. I kind of got it. I kind of got it. Like this, this was fine as a TED talk. Right. And that it's, it's not a reflection of the quality of the thinking per se, but it's like the, the format, a book is, you know, 50, 60,000 words. A book is 250 pages. Like, right. right. It's very so different. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, but having the space actually to um, to tease apart those things and to put them in their proper place is a is a real gift, is a real luxury. Got it. Cool. Any other as we start to wrap up here, thoughts, reflections, thing you want to share on the journey? And I know it's early. It's very early uh, in in the process, not in terms of time of day. But any any other things that come to mind as you're going down this path? Well, you know, like I will just show, you know, this is my, I'm in my home office here, but you can see ideas are everywhere. Right. And I would say in the journey, one of the things that's been that was phenomenally helpful for me is to develop a habit of writing just a daily blog. You know, it's something mm -hmm. Seth Godin has mentioned. It's something that yeah. um, Austin Cleon, many, many have mentioned, but the value of learning to express your ideas in writing you can do it today you, a book isn't the first thing you know no, first thing you start writing right. some things down and don't think about what's the outline or what's what are you know for me i give myself a challenge of 30 minutes a day you know can i crystallize an idea an observation a piece of research or an insight or a story 30 minutes a day and and share it i share you know i share it with the world on my blog i, I write a blog every day but it's very useful to get in the habit of committing things to paper or things to the page, because then beyond getting in the you know, habit of actually writing, you have a, a wealth of material that you can start to draw on and say, well, how does this fit? And how does this fit? And, and you yeah. know, things like hyperlinking, for example, like I find my blog is basically an external hard drive for my brain. <laughs> and there's so many links that, there that if I go there, I start linking to stories and ideas that, I had forgotten the connections that I had made, right? That's and so, so having a place like that, it's a little bit different. You know, I've got Evernote notes. You know, if you sure. talk to Stephen Johnson or Dan Pink or, you know, famous yep. authors, they've got, you know, logs, they've got notes, they've got files where they keep inspiration. I find there's something about the hyperlinking functionality of a blog that's actually really useful and allows you, even as a researcher, track, and track, yeah, 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 yeah. Track, yeah. track, you know, streams of thought in an unexpected way. No, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. It's a great book. You should run out, not you, because you already have one, but everyone but okay. you should run out and buy a copy of it. If folks go to the website right now, ideaflow.design, they can also get a free chapter of a bonus chapter called How to Think Like Bezos and Jobs, which is a really great and a summary of some of the ways in which Bezos and Jobs approach problem solving. And that's free on the website. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate your time today, Jeremy. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.